This is a video on um, chapter eight, section 8.1. The learning objective that, that I um, hope you achieve is to estimate and interpret regression models with interaction variables. This is technically part of, in some sense, could be part of the initial learning of doing um, regression analysis. Um, there are other um, topics covered in chapter eight that really fit more into the nonlinear regression um, topic Interaction is technically nonlinear, but it is considered so fundamental that, I, I mean, I can see why they put it in chapter eight. Okay, so remember, all models are wrong, some models are useful. So the idea is we want to try and find um, a reliable, useful model. So the regression equation in a multiple linear regression scenario, right, is that we have the coefficients, the slopes, on each of the predictor va variables. And that um, any one of these, so beta, I mean, sorry, B sub J, it's going to measure the change in the predicted value of the response given a unit increase in the predictor, holding all other predictor variables constant. So we say that that slope, right, is the partial or marginal effect of that predictor on the response. For those of you who've studied calculus, this is what is referred to as the partial derivative. So um, if you hold every all the values constant and you look at that slope, remember the units on that are rise over run. So whatever the units of response per one unit increase in the predictor variable. And it does not depend on other predictor variables. Okay, that's a straightforward sim uh, multiple linear regression analysis. But sometimes two predictor variables can magnify each other. So consider if you're studying weight loss and that's your response variable and you have two predictors. One is a diet pill and one is, and another one is drinking diet soda. Um, and the idea is um, in a regression model, each of these has their main effect, how much they independently influence weight loss. It's possible that together they also have a, impact on weight loss that is more or less than the individual effects. So for example, if the diet pill works by curbing appetite um, and you're drinking a diet soda that has um, caffeine or fills you up but doesn't add di uh, calories or sugar, then the possibility is that together they work better than each alone. All right, or it could be worse. <laughs> um, so drink yes no so let's say that what we're we're looking at is weight loss after one week and whether they drink diet sodas yes or no whether they take a diet pill yes or no um, and so it's possible that um, you see a difference between the effect of um, the drinking that is greater if the pill is also taken and vice versa we see a difference with the um, pills taken that's in bigger when the uh, diet drinks are also incorporated. I don't know if that's true, by the way. <laughs> I don't, actually don't trust diet drinks. All right. Um, so the interaction effect in a regression model occurs when the partial effect of a predictor variable on the response depends on the value of another predictor variable. So the way we capture it mathematically is we put in the product of the two predictor variables. So, um, oops, let me see if I can get this on here, yeah. So we've added now this term right here, x1 times x2, and it's gonna have its own assumed effect, okay? Um, so the regression equation, the estimated regression equation is gonna be B3, so we have a slope coefficient on the product of the two predictors. And I'm not sure if I can advance with the right, let's see. Oh yeah, okay. So the partial effect on X1 is gonna be given by, so the way you find that out um, is you find out what are, where is X1 and what are, what 
are the coefficients on x1. Here's an x1, and here's another x1. Whoops, please don't do that. OK, that did not go so well. It's not letting me erase it. Oh, jeez. All right, apologies for that. Okay, let me try and go back to this. Okay, I'm gonna try not to write as much, but I want you to focus on this coefficient and that B3 times X2 is a coefficient on X1. Oh, there's possibly some. Okay. And so it depends on the value of x2. Sim similarly, the partial effect of x2 on y hat is given by b2. So we get the coefficients of b2 and then b3 times x1. And so that depends on the value of x1. So that's why we call that an interaction effect. Um, it occurs, right? So the first bullet is what we just got done saying. It can be between any two predictors. So you can have it between two dummy variables, a dummy and a numerical, or any two numericals. So it doesn't matter. Any two predictors can have an interaction. And when do you consider interactions? Well, there's really no definitive answer. And different approaches exist. And this is an area of active research. Um, and um, I think I even mentioned that AI is being pulled in, and there's different techniques. So. For us in this introductory um, course, I suggest you swap out, after you swap out for multicollinearity is a good time to try each possible interaction of what's left of your top contender model. Sometimes those in, um, including interaction improves your model a lot. So um, the way we're gonna include interaction in the model is really straightforward and simple. You're gonna add a new column to your data and the two predictors that you think that you want to check if they have an interaction, you're going to create a new column and it's going to be the product of their values. So predictor one times predictor two. And then you include it in the regression analysis as if it was its own totally different predictor. And um, we're going to um, look to see what is the p-value on it. So um, if the p-value, so if the coefficient on the interaction is significant, we're going to keep it. Um, what, what can happen sometimes is it can um, cause one of the individual predictors that used to be significant is now no longer. But if you include the interaction term, you're going to include the individual components of it. So if you have predictor one and predictor two, and it turns out that the product, predictor one times predictor two, has a significant coefficient, so the p-value is less than 0.05, but now one of the predictors is not is no longer, you still keep it because it's part of the interaction term. All right, so consider a regression model with two variables, x1 and x2, and an interaction variable, x1 times x2. So the partial, so I'm going to review this partial effect stuff. So it's basically just algebra. The partial effect of x1 on y hat is factoring out, right? So here, I've rewritten it. So you've written, you pull out B1 and you pull out B3 times X2 times X1, right? Plus B2 X2. So the partial effect is the coefficient on the X1. And obviously whatever that number is depends on what X2 you plug in, All right? Similarly, you can regroup going back to the um, initial equation and regroup this, the last two terms and factor out an x2. So you get b2 plus b3 times x1, and that is the partial effect of um, x2 on the predicted value um, response. And it is dependent on what x1 it is. So I kind of think of it this way. If you think about it in three dimensions, you have um, one dimension is x1, one dimension is x2. And we are actually trying to predict um, values um, on the y-axis, which in this case would be the third dimension. It turns out kind of looking like a sheet if you were gonna um, graph this. We're kind of taking slices. So we're kind of like, you pick an x1 value, that's where your slice is. So where's my 
So in this case, we like pick an X1, that's your slice. Then you um, look around there and there we, that's where you'll see the partial effect of the second predictor on the response. But you have, the only way to really kind of give it a value is to actually nail down that X1. So a lot of times what people do is they'll just use the average in the sample data. So they'll take the average of one predictor and they'll plug it into that X for that X1 point value. So they just sub that in and that way they actually know what the partial effect of the other predictor is at the mean of the first one. Right. Um, all right. So if it's if the coefficient on that average is positive, then as for values of the predictor that are greater than the average, you're going to have a greater impact on the response. But if that coefficient's negative, then for lower values, sorry, for higher values, instead the effect will go down. And some of this may take just some thinking about it when you look at the results to be really clear. And so the second bullet is just the vice versa. So if you if you plug in the um, average value of the sample data for one predictor, the partial effect of the second predictor on the response is um, beta two plus, I'm sorry, B2 plus B3 times that average. And this coefficient, the sign on the coefficient is basically telling you if this, if you, for values that are above the average, you're going to have more of a, an effect um, from the second predictor on the response. Um, if that slope is negative, then for values greater than the average, you're going to have a, a less of an influence. All right. And then the whole thing gets switched around if the coefficient is negative. OK. So I want to just do a quick example with you. This is the data um, in Brightspace um, that is at the bottom of your data. It's called Interaction and Regression 8.1. If you could please download that. And um, we'll work with that data. So this is regarding um, MBA applications. There's some concern that there's less people going for an MBA than there used to be. So when you download this data, um, it says MSA. Let's rename that MBA. I, I kind of modified this a little bit from what was in the book. Let's just do that. OK. So um, this is data, right, on the number of applicants. Um, how much was spent in thousands of dollars on marketing, and um, what percentage of the graduates from the MBA program are, are employed within three months. All right. So the first thing we're going to do when we do this is we are going to um, skip a bunch of steps that you would normally need to do. OK, so I have my little worked out example here if it's going to open for me. Here we go. All right, so um, we're skipping checking for outliers, running correlations, checking for multicollinearity, stepping down, and model assumptions. So we're kind of skipping everything you should be doing. Um, we're jumping right into the uh, running this full model. So we'll just call this the full model. All right. So we're trying to predict the number of applicants. And we're going to jump into assuming we can just use all this data very sloppy modeling. We don't normally want to do that. Put the output range here. OK, I'm going to at least get the, um, while I'm kind of going through this, I'm going to um, at least get the residual plots. Oh, what's going on? 
input range contains non-numerical data. Did we forget to hit labels? Yep. All right, so you get that error probably because you forgot labels. All right. All right, once again, I don't care about this stuff. It's just a repeat. All right, so generally uh, we are going to just check real quick uh, marketing and residual employed residual plots and marketing. So since we skipped all this, I'm just kind of wanted to throw these residual plots out there to make sure we don't see anything glaring. These both almost look like the gold standard. So we're looking really good. This is, you know, data that is designed to help us just focus on the next thing. So all these problems have been overcome. We have a good model, good top contender model, green light here. We can trust, it looks like based on what I'm seeing in the residuals, we can trust um, the p-values that we're seeing. These are all really small. So these are all significant, right? So everything here is looking good. All right, so now if we wanna run the interaction, what we're gonna do is come back to our data. So now let's say that you've gone through all these steps, you get to this, this is your top contender. Now your next thing is you wanna to look to see if there's possibly an interaction between marketing and employed um, that is significant. So we're gonna come up to our data and um, we're gonna add a new variable. So it's gonna be called marketing times employed. All right, and it's just exactly what it says it is. We're gonna go marketing times employed. And we're going to add this new column to our data. And now we're gonna run um, the model model with interaction. So let's run that regression model again. It's gonna have the same response, the number of applicants, but now our predictors are gonna also have this third column, okay? Let's pick a new place so we don't overwrite what's there. Okay. All righty, so let's see what happened here. Okay, so first of all, we have a significance that looks good and um, we're gonna look at the p-values. So notice that these p-values, um, the interaction one and employed, the employment rate are still significant, but we've now lost significance on marketing. Okay. So we have this concern here, but that's okay. Because if the interaction term is significant, the fact that this dropped down you know, it was significant without the interaction and now it, you know, it has to first meet this hurdle. It has to be significant on its own. And then when you add the interaction, if that becomes not significant, that's okay. All right, so that's not a problem. Okay, and so what we're gonna wanna do is um, compare the full model with the interaction. All right, also let's just look at the C, make sure there's any big problems that showed up. We already ran these, so the individual, oops. The individual, we already knew we're looking good and we can still see generally pretty good on the residual plot for the market, the interaction term. You see a little bit of a fan stuff happening here, but it's not too severe. Now, you could always dig into this more with nonlinear approaches to see if you can improve this model, but for, for our purposes, this is gonna be fine. Okay, so um, let me grab this one. All right, so let's um, compare the model. So we're gonna do the model results comparison table. So we'll start with um, full model. And remember, we wanna get the predictor, the coefficient, and the p-value. So let's come over to that um, full model. and the p-value. If you want, you can convert these over to numbers and all that. I'm just kind of going a little quick here. All right, and then we need the goodness of fit measures. 
So we're going to also get the interaction term, uh, sorry, with interaction. And we're going to get the same things for that one. So for that, we're going to grab this stuff right here. And the p-values for that, including the one for the intercept, we'll bring that over as well. OK. All right, so then we need the goodness of fit measures. So let's come and get the goodness of fit measures from the full model. I'm going to try to line them up. And then the goodness of fit measures for the model with interaction. OK. Just make sure this is clear what we're doing here. This is the model with interaction. All right, let's um, just really quick format this table. Okay, so now we're ready for a head-to-head -head competition. We see the adjusted R squared here is better with interaction. Um, and we see that the standard error came down as well. So they're in agreement. Um, so the um, better model, right? So the better model is going to be the one with interaction. Okay, so this is what we would call our final model. All righty. And we have a, a total R squared of 75%. All right, so here I pulled out into the regression equation. So the applicants is, right? So I'm using the coefficients here to put together the equation. Minus 16.6359 plus put the 0 0.0865 times the how much marketing is spent in thousands of dollars, remember? And then 0 0.5405 times the employment rate as a percent. And then a 0 0.0039 effect from the combination of marketing with employment. Okay, so one thing to notice is an interpretation of this um, non-significant marketing coefficient is that it's only effective when um, the school has a higher employment rate for graduates. Okay, so that is saying that um, marketing is, kicks in, if you will, a significant when the employment rate goes up. And since the intera interaction with marketing is included, we keep the marketing in the model even though it's not significant. So I think I already talked about that. All right, so now let's interpret this. So here's that same regression equation. And I just re, I did a little algebra and I found the term that has the marketing in front, uh, that has marketing as a factor. So I pulled out the 0 0.065 and over here I pulled out marketing and I got let, what was I was left with is this part right here. Oh, don't do that. Okay. So. For a given employment percent, a hundred thousand dollars increase in the marketing expense is predicted to bring in. So this 0.0065 times this 
we don't know what the employment percent is, but we're going to do 100,000. Remember, um, marketing is in thousands of dollars. So multiply that by 100. Now I distribute that through this. And I find that the result is for $100,000 increase in marketing, I'm going to have 8.65 more applicants plus 0.39 times whatever the current rate of employed uh, three within three months post-graduation is, okay? So if the employment rate is 70%, then I would just put in for this number 0.7. And I calculate through that and I get that it's 36.1 more applicants. But if the employment rate's only 30%, because of this interaction, I'm gonna put that 30 into this equation and I get that it's only um, predicted to have, the school is only predicted to have 20 more applicants. All right, and for the second one, we just regroup. Um, we, we factor this third term differently. We pull out employed. So we're gonna have the 0 0.405. So this is the impact, the partial effect of employed. And what we're gonna do is we factor that out from the original regression equation and we group them. So it's 0.5. 405 plus 0 0.0039 times whatever the marketing expenditure is. So for a 5% increase in an employed, so if we're able to help get more graduates at this college, any particular college in this data set, we're able to, um, if the colleges are able to increase the percentage that are employed within three months, um, we're going to just put a five in, sorry, right here for the employed and distribute that through and you get 2.7 more applicants on just from the pure effect of raising the employment rate, plus the, the interaction term is gonna give you a 0.02 roughly for every thousand dollars that are spent on, on marketing. So if they spend 15,000, we're gonna put 15 in here and that amounts to uh, around three more applicants in total. Uh, but if the marketing spend is 125,000, Right now, instead of uh, getting three more applicants, you get a prediction of five more applicants. Okay, so hopefully you understand. It's a little convoluted, but if you just follow the algebra, that's how you interpret these interaction terms. Okay, here's another one, and this is based on um, the GP uh, salary in thousands of dollars, along with GPA and whether a student had a BAI concentration, so that's a dummy one zero, or a minor in statistics. So that's, a, again, a dummy one zero. And if we go back to our data, we can run this with interaction. So going back to the, um, this really should be BAI and stats, and the influence of BAI and stats, okay. So, Going back to all the things we're not doing, let me just copy that. We're skipping a bunch of stuff and we're just jumping to this last step of um, considering interactions. Okay. So um, if we run um, the full model first, right? We're trying to predict the response is salary. And the full model is going to be including, assuming this is our final contender model, because again, we're not really doing what we should be doing. Um, we're gonna select our output range for the full model. I'll just put it right here. And um, I'm not gonna do residual plots right now. I'm just gonna try to Assume it's okay. Let's call, so let's just call this the uh, full model, no interactions. Notice how I'm labeling my work. You wanna be doing that. You wanna label your work so it's clear. Okay. Okay. 
and our p-values are all very significant. All right, so now if you were going to begin to check your interactions, you would check your interactions between every pair of these. So you want to check interactions. So the next step would be to check the following interactions. And you would do it um, one at a time and then start doing them two at a time. All right, so the following interactions that you're going to want to check is, um, oh, and this data should have had BAI up here. Sorry. I wanted to change it all and I forgot to do that. Okay. Right, so that's all BAI. Okay, concentrate because MIS is Management Information Systems, which has now changed names to BAI. Okay, so I just want to kind of keep it relevant to URI. Okay, so we're going to check the following interactions. We're going to check, um, you can just go down if you want to do it order in an ordered way, GPA and BAI. Now go GPA and stats. Now, okay, so all I did was pick the first one and then compare that to the second one and then the first one to the third one. Now that I finished with the first one, I go, come down one and I go BAI and stats. All right, and those are all the interactions that I wanna check, all right? And then, um, so those are three interactions right there. So then you want to check um, GPA and BAI. And the next one, GPA and stats. So I'm taking the first one and I'm going to compare it to the second and the second one. And I'm also going to do the first one and the third one. So. There's a lot of, um, and so this would be BAI and stats. Okay, finally, I'm going to do the same thing with GPA and stats. So GPA and, oops, I meant to say GPA and stats. And GPA. So GPA and stats, and then BAI and stats. All right, so. And maybe it would make more sense to you guys if I wrote it this way. So GPA and instead of and, I should say times. So this, it's gonna, this is what we're gonna be doing. And this is GPA times stats. And then this one's going to be BAI times stats. All right, and then all of these we're just going to replace. Where to go? Where is my editing? Oh, there it is, okay. All right, so these are the different models that you would wanna check for interactions. And I'm only gonna do one of them for you. The one I'm gonna do is the um, this one. So I'm gonna do this one. So obviously, you can check more and, and possibly find a better model than the one I'm going to work on. Um, and you're gonna wanna run, create the model comparison table to compare your different results to see which is really the one that you think is the best one to go forward with. Okay, so. Um, going to look at the adjusted R squared and the standard error on those, right? All right, so for example, I'm going to just, maybe I'll do two of them. So I'll just start out with the interaction of GPA times 
um, BAI. Oh no, the one I highlighted in yellow is BAI times stats. Sorry, BAI times stats. All right, so I need BAI times stats. So I'm gonna have to add that column of data here. So I'm just gonna say this is equal to BAI, whoops, not GPA, BAI times stats. Now that I have that, I'm gonna add that to my regression analysis. Same response is salary, but now my predictors are going to be four predictors. Okay, and I'm gonna assume again that the model assumptions are okay. So we're gonna just proceed right now with this information. Okay, don't need this. All right, so p-value on the joint significance is still a green light. Um, now we're going to look at these p-values, and if you want, you can make them into numbers. And we're comparing them to these p-values. Well, we're just observing them. We're not. We're not doing. We're not doing any big comparison. We're just observing what happened. All right. So in this case, you see that we do have. We still keep all these as significant, right? They were significant in this full model. They're still significant. And what we're going to compare is our, our adjusted R squared. So 0.79 versus 0.80. So this one's winning, right? And then we want a smaller standard error. So that one's a little smaller. So again, this is our top contender. OK. Now, um, maybe I'm going to look at the BAI and stats along with the um, GPA and BAI. So maybe I'll do this one just to show you what I'm talking about. So let's say I want to go ahead and um, look at GPI and stats. Now GPI and stats and BI and stats. So I ran them all, but I'm not going to do that with you guys in this video. I ran them all. I just happen to know this one ends up being the best model, I believe. Is that the best model? Yeah. So I want to show you like how how that looks. All right, so um, I'm going to have interaction with BI and stats. And um, and GPA and stats. OK, interaction is not multicollinearity. It just means one either enhances or diminishes the other. OK, so I need this new variable GPA times stats. So I'm going to go in here and add that in here. So that's going to be GPA times stats. And that's just going to equal GPA and then times the dummy variable if there had a statistics minor. And we'll copy that down. All right. Run the regression now with all this data. All right, let's look at these p-values here.
Hmm. That's really weird. Oh, actually, this is not a better model, right? Because these p-values are not, this GPA in stats is not significant. All right, so this is not a better model. Um, so this is going to be a final. Well, you'd have to run them all to see which one actually gives you significant in your um, individual predictors before you add interaction. And then it, the interaction term needs to be significant. So this one, um, the interaction term was not significant. Okay. So um, I'd have to run these other ones and see. But right now, this is my top contender. So this is our top contender. Okay. So here's that information that we just got. And we saw that we have this um, effects of um, GPA is like 6,710 for each additional point in the GPA on the annual salary. And then if there's a concentration in BAI, it adds another 5,000 $325 to the annual salary. And if there's a minor in statistics, it adds another $5,535 to the annual salary. And then furthermore, if you have both a BAI concentration and a statistics minor, it, on top of each of those, it's going to add another $3,491.50 predicted salary. Real data, folks. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's look into this and interpret it. We want to inter estimate and interpret the effect of GPA, BAI, and statistics on salary. Predict the salary of a business graduate with, an, with and without a BAI concentration and a statistics minor. We're going to use a GPA of 3.5 to make those predictions. So um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have um, if neither, so we put all zero in there, so we just basically are gonna plug um, this information into the sum product little table in Excel and come up with each of these variations on um, what we're gonna get. So let's go ahead and let me show you how to do that. So in our final model, we're gonna have our um, predictor, the coefficient, and then we're gonna have the predictor values, right? Maybe I want to put these side by side so you guys can kind of see what's going on. It's not going to let me. All right, that's fine. It's not going to let me. Um, we'll just work here in this little space. OK, so the first one we'll say is neither. So no B AI concentration and no stats minor. All right, so let's go ahead and grab these coefficients. All right, so in that case, we always include the intercept. The GPA, they, we wanna basically set a line in the sand to slice through our multidimensional space. Uh, and we're gonna look at where in GPA is 3.5. BAI is zero because it's neither, and stats is zero. And then the product is always going to be the product of the previous two values. So it's going to be that times this one. And then we're going to have the predicted salary, right? And this is going to be the sum product of this times this. OK. And this is actually, we can, um, format this number as currency, because it is a salary. 
Um, it's not $67.59 though, is it? It's in thousands of dollars. So we can come up here and just multiply this by a thousand if we want it to be in units of dollar. So it's 67,588 if we round to the penny. All right, so now um, in here, I can just change this to be an absolute reference to those coefficients. Remember a function f4, and then I can copy and fill in this table. So then I can say just BAI, and I'm gonna copy this whole part here. And I'm gonna come down to BAI, I'm gonna put a one, okay? So that's going to give me the 72,913. And I can do the same thing. And I can get all these different options and see what happens to the salaries. Um, so this is going to be just statistics minor. So that means not a BAI concentration, but a statistics minor. And that's a $73,000. Um, Initial, uh, initial salary, and then both BAI and stats. So let me come over a little bit more and I'll just say both. So we see how individually they each add to neither a certain amount, right? But then if you have both, they're gonna, they have uh, an effect um, due to their interaction. So we're going to go and say, now we have both a BAI and a stats, and we get an 81,939. Okay. I believe that might be the last of what I want to cover um, as examples. There are, there's another example in the slides, but I, I'm going to just let you review that. Um, and this is just a, an example of a dummy and numerical. You have to turn um, the race variable into um, a dummy bar variable. So you have to create a dummy variable. And same idea, we're gonna skip over all the good modeling steps and come up with our interaction model, which in, it's not always better, by the way. I've showed you three examples where there, it's better, but it's not always better. Sometimes the model's better without the interaction. So. Don't always just assume you have, you know, interactions going to help. Frequently it will. Um, okay. And then um, that there's our, um, if you run this model, and I hope you will, this is the third data set in, in that worksheet, that work that workbook. Um, you can consider the different effects um, on the partial effect of weight on the systolic blood pressure and the partial effect of um, being black. And you can fill out this table using the information that we have so far. So guidelines for interpretation. A linear regression empirically validates relationships between variables and quantifies the strength of the relationship. Note, a significant predictor is just that, a predictor of the value of the response. Causation is not claimed or proven. Now we've been doing a lot of things where we sort of are implying in our interpretation causation. It's only implied. And really um, you'd have to run um, controlled experiments to confirm causation. Um, so as you go through this modeling, you always wanna be checking um, with, you know, real world sanity, you know, as logical deductions and reasoning have to be constantly employed. And that's the end of the lecture.